Good day, everybody, and welcome to the 2008 ISU Short Track Speed Skating Official Seminar. We're live from Frankfurt, uh, and uh, before we start with the special regulation and technical rule workshop, I just want to introduce a few guests that we have with us today. Um, and uh, let's start with our Vice President, Speed, Mr. Tron Espeli. And we're very thankful to the Development Commission to enable us to do this live with you today. And uh, from that commission, we have uh, Ms. Gildao Gemser. <laughs> from the Short Track Technical Committee, we have, uh, the, the, we have the, the members, uh, Kim Sohi from Korea. <laughs> from Germany, Christoph Mills. From Belgium, Wim De Dijn. From Japan, Satoru Teraru. Our sports director, Mr. Hugo Hernoff. And at the other very end of the room, we have our first council member elected, Mr. Stoichur Storchev. So thank you all for joining us. In the room, you have 80 uh, people, a total of 80 people, 70 ISU and international official, mostly referees, about 40 referees and about 30 competitor stewards that are present from 20 countries, um, 20 of your uh, ISU member country. So we're welcoming everybody and we're welcoming you from home and we're hoping that you will find the next hour and a half constructive and that uh, you will understand better our rules and why we brought those rules together and what it means for every one of you. So let's start because we have a pack agenda. Basically what we will do today as I said is we will go through all the main change to the rule. Um, we will try to explain them what it means for your athletes, for uh, everybody involved and also why we worked on putting those change together. So in the first section, we will cover the special regulation for short track speed skating. And we will go, if you have the rule book, if you don't have the rule book, you can download it from the ISU web website at isu.org. But if you do have the rule book, we will go in order of the rule numbers. So starting with the special regulation. And uh, basically, the first rule that we have made change to is relating to uh, the tracks. In the past, we were working with only five tracks, and we wanted to open the door to explore what we could do with seven tracks. Why seven? Why not six? Because six, there's no middle. So uh, we thought seven would be, uh, would be uh, the perfect choice. And with seven tracks, uh, what it means is organizers can choose, actually. It's not mandatory. If they already have the, uh, the lines built in their ice rink for this season, they don't need to switch to the seven tracks, but we're hoping that many organizers will uh, explore this. Um, this is what it will look like with seven track. It doesn't make a big difference into how far outside on each way you're going. It's a 10 centimeter difference, which is about this much more closer to the board. But the reason why we made that change is basically there will be more fresh tracks for skater to race on. Um, it's, as I said, it's not really getting them much closer to the board, but um, if we have uh, some tracks that are uh, basically ruined because there's a crack, there will be more time to repair that track and let it rest a little bit and freeze back because we can play with more tracks. And we want to explore and see if this will be better for the athletes. Now rule 281, 283 and 285 relates to the championship. And basically this one specifically relates to the ranking final. So where our old rule used to say if you're not qualified for the quarterfinal and the semifinal, but sometimes we have heats in the main program. Now we're saying that if you're not qualified for the main program, you can race the ranking finals. It means that, and also in blocks. So what it means is that if you were eliminated in the first round, which means the preliminary, you will have access to the ranking final with other skaters that were eliminated in the preliminary. And if you made it to the second round of the heats, you will race in the ranking final with skaters who were eliminated from the heats as well, not moving on to the quarterfinal. And you'll be in separate blocks. So therefore, your results will also stay in separate blocks. 
again, it, la, in the junior championships, sometimes we had heats in the main blocks, which meant that by our rule, the skaters not qualifying for the quarterfinal was kind of a problem. So now this corrects this. So the skaters that are not participating in the ranking final will be ranked after those who have participated in the ranking final in their respective block. So it means, again, if, for instance, you get a penalty on the Friday in the heats, therefore you cannot race in your ranking final, you will not be ranked completely last. You will be ranked last of those who had made it in the heats. Is that clear? Not so clear? Here, this should make it a little clearer. So this kind of will be the order. Skaters qualified for the second round and racing the ranking final. Then skaters qualified for the second round but not racing the ranking finals. And then you will have skaters eliminated in the first round and racing the ranking finals. And then skaters eliminated in the first round, uh, first round and not racing the ranking final. Another rule that uh, has been accepted regarding uh, the championship is um, the B final for the relay will now be raced after the ranking final on the Sunday morning. What it means is that the B finals are completely out of the main program in our championships. So we're only racing the A final. And the reason why we did that is because it was getting a little long for the public to have the champion after the 3,000 meter. Then you have the relay final, then you had the B final, and then you had the medals. And it was a little bit anticlimax to have the B final after you just crowned the A final world champions for the relay. So we believe that uh, we, have, we will have more spectators staying till the very end when we're actually giving uh, the medals. The program is subject to change based on the number of entries and local circumstances. So qualifying rounds can be added um, to the Saturday and Sunday program if needed. Basically, this rule came so we have more flexibility to make some changes in the program when we need it. Um, and that rule came up because in the past there were instances where the rigidity in the rule make it hard to adapt the program. For instance, in the Junior World Championship, uh, our championship has so much competitors that it basically had reached its capacity. And so uh, it, this way we can actually put rounds in the Saturday and the Sunday and, and it makes it a more even balanced championship instead of having a, a Friday that will last maybe 17 or 18 hours. Rule 282, we're actually so proud to have uh, drafted the, th this rule, is basically for the past few years, we were working in the hope to get a new event in the Olympic. At the time where we entered those rules, we were working on an event that was multi-layered. So you see some wording in there that, in effect, will not really be used this year. We still want to have it there because we want to have the possibility to explore maybe more events. But what was accepted and we're so happy is our mixed gender relay. So when we came to the Congress, it was uh, with these rules. So a mixed gender team competition will follow the listed basic requirements. So we have it in the book. If we want to uh, test it more over the next few years, we will have the possibility to do it. But at this particular moment, one of the layers we were working on was accepted by the IOC. So we're extremely proud to say that we do have a new event in the 2022 Beijing program, and it's a mixed gender relay. So we have the basic rule in the rule book. Most of the detail of the rule were issued in communication 2183. Is that 83? Yeah, 2183. So if you want to see them in detail, that was just issued. We're going to run with this rule this year, and then we will see if our event is perfect or if uh, there is still some little fine tuning to do with it to finalize it in the next rule uh, Congress. So for our mix, uh, gender relay, basically the, it's a 2,000 meter, it's an 18 lap, and 
Each team will consist of two men and two ladies. And it's a fixed schedule for the exchange. So the fixed schedule is four times 2.5 laps and then four times two laps. And it will be run lady, lady, men, men, lady, lady, men, men. So it's a little different from our regular relay. Uh, it's a the fixed schedule, the mixed gender, the sprint distance. And now for the World Junior Championship, uh, Rule 283, um, basically, what it says is the distance will be 500,000 and 1,500 meter, and you no longer see the 1,500 meter super final. What it means in effect is that the Junior World Championship is changing into a single distance championship. So you no longer have the super final, you no longer have an overall world champion, but you have three single distance champion at the junior level, so you will have a junior champion 500 meter, a world junior champion 1,000 meter, and a world junior champion 1,500 meter. Why we made the change is um, we're working on perhaps, if this goes well and it's well accepted by the member, transforming uh, all championships. We're, we're, that's the work in progress. And also, um, eventually, that would mean removing the 3,000 meter at the senior level. And the reason also that we made that change is basically because the Junior World Championship had too many competitors, so we needed to address that problem right away. And it was accepted by, by the Congress, and uh, that was the solution that was put forward. So for the season 2019-2020, this uh, following season, basically what it will mean is every member will have the right to enter three competitors in each category. But each race, each distance will be raced by two out of the three, which means they can swap skater between a distance and another distance. And the members who will enter a relay team will be allowed to enter four skaters, just like it is right now. And they will be able to swap skaters between a distance and the next. That's for 2020. Exceptionally for 2019, because it's the first year, every member still can race with three skater in every distance. In effect, that means that those entering a relay team can swap one skater. What it means for the future is a little less skater per distance, the possibility to change those skaters, so to have specialists, uh, so the specialist will be able to participate in the Junior World Championship. And we made the change because it was not a workable format anymore. In the actual uh, format, there was just too many participants. And uh, there was, uh, it's a chance to reduce the overall number of race, but not reduce the overall number of participants if you register a relay team. And it's also what was really important for us is we don't want to send more skaters sitting in the stand just waiting for the relay. We want every skater coming to competition to have a chance to participate as much as possible, even if we have a lot of competitors in competition. So from the season 2019-2020, also because we made that change, the Junior World Championship will have the same uh, access to, uh, as a host member to have just like the other championships. So we're making all the championships similar and equal. Basically what it means is if you're the host member and you haven't qualified three skater for a distance, you will be allowed to still have three entry. But the following year you're changing, your, your, you're putting back your results to what it was before. This already exists at the senior level in the European and the, champion, the World Championship. Now we're putting it also for the Junior World. Question? So for 2019-2020, there is the possibility to have full quota at home because of this rule now. And it gives a better chance for an organizing committee to sell tickets if you have all participants possible in every distance. What it also means, because now it's a single distance format, is basically if you have a skater, for whatever reason, uh, who cannot participate in a distance, and the distance has not started yet, 
it is possible to make a change. Where in our other championship, it is not because there is also an overall format. But now this one is completely single. So if there is a last minute injury or illness, it will be possible to change a skater before the start of the first qualifying round of any of the distance of the Junior World Championship. That's the reason. For the first round of the relay race for the Junior World Championship, the seeding will from now on follow the classification of the relay competition from the previous year of the Junior World Championship. It means a clearer seeding based on results from the previous, from the team at the junior level and not from the team that are doing the World Cup. And it's to ensure that from one year to the next, the seeding would always be done the same way, because uh, we realized that in the past, it was th uh, the interpretation of how the seeding was to be done was different from, from one team to the next. So now it clarifies this. These next sets of rules, basically, um, as of 2019-2020, um, we have now two championships that are um, for all members, basically. One is for the European member that already existed. It's a European championship. The equivalent is now um, accepted and will start in 2020 for the rest of the world. Basically, it's the four continent championship. Um, so the four continent championship for, uh, was accepted at the Congress for both short track and long track. For short track, it's exactly the same rules as the European championship with small minor changes, but mostly it will be run in the same format. So just like at the European, it will be an overall, a single format and an overall. There will be a 3,000 meter, there will be relay. Um, and so uh, all that is the same. Um, and the introduction of the four continents will start as of season 2019, 2020. Yes. Yes, Peter. Sorry, just to clarify on the, uh, the four continents championships, uh, am I right and correct? Am I correct in thinking that everybody is uh, eligible to that one? No. So who, who, who are the four continents? The four continents is everybody who's not eligible for the European Championship. So the four continents is everybody except the European members? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. I know, uh, what? Not what it says here in my slide or not what it says in the rule book? In the rule book? It says that with all members. No, okay. That's what it says. Okay. It's for everybody who's not in the European Championship. Okay? Okay. But it's clear for everyone here, right? It's clear for everyone here. Actually, uh, Fabrice has noticed that, uh, that uh, omission and it will be in the final version of the book. Okay? Peter? Yes. Okay. I know, you don't need to look for it, Jim. I know it's missing a word in, in the rule book. It will be on the final rule book. So when, when, when it comes out and you receive a printed copy, it will be in there. Okay. Four continent, everybody who's not at European. Okay, the one thing I did not mention under that is the only change between the, the four continent and the European championship is in the four continent, it will be a maximum of eight relay team participating. In the European Championship, you're still going with 12 relay team participating, but in the, in the four continent, it will be a maximum of eight team, including the host member. Okay, officials, rule 289. Uh, we do have, and we've been talking about this over the past few days with the group of referee, we have now officially in the rule book a uh, video specialty. So we've been working towards um, defining that specialty. And as of this year, uh, we will start marking with a V, our video specialist. So we believe that we will have more consistency in the decision by having less different people behind the video. Currently with our rule, basically every referee could be assigned behind the video. And uh, with this, we're going to define uh, who will be the people that from now on will um, be video specialists. So some, during this weekend, uh, some of you have already raised a hand saying, yes, we want to be video specialists, and we're really happy about that. 
uh, and at the end of the weekend, we will conclude, hopefully, who has an interest for this specialty and move on from, uh, from that coming up this season. We also have a new uh, identification for long-time uh, ISU officials that served uh, on the ISU list, and because of the age, they need to be retired from that list, but are still sometimes active and are still uh, involved. And so for that now, we will have uh, the letter S for senior in recognition of the fact that they're, they're not on the international list because they were demoted. They are put back on the international list because they still want to be there and because they've served uh, so, so on the ISU list. So we have this, it's not a new category, but it's a distinction for those special officials. So it's an S for special. <laughs> Official necessary. As part of our education and development plan, we want to be able to have apprentice officials be able to uh, play an active role in our event and learn with mentors. And in order to do, to do that, we needed to have the rule a little bit more flexible. So referee and three assistant referee, at least one of the assistant referee will be assigned to the video replay system. And an assistant video referee can also be the first assistant referee. So this gives us a little bit more flexibility to play with position and, and definitely um, serves the purpose of uh, putting people in various roles to educate them. Yes, Alexandro. For example, a chief referee can switch during the competition from the video to the first assistant referee or not. You mean the chief referee can tell the video yeah. and the first assistant to switch? Yeah. I would not do that without asking Hugo or the TC before, but it means that, yes, we can swap those positions. Yes. Because the case that I was mentioning, I think, yesterday, if yes, the chief yes, yes, referee, yes. due to illness or something else, is sick, yeah. and the first assistant has got the A, yeah. that means that he can, she or he cannot be chief referee, while the video referee has not the A, so it can substitute him, yes. shall we switch from the video to first assistant and then to first assistant to chief referee? Yes. Okay. So, I, I, sorry, I misunderstood you. Yes. So yeah. the first assistant can be assigned to the video. If something happens to the chief referee, that person could then, uh, it could be decided that that person is the chief referee. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in, 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 the, in this example, the chief referee is sick with the collaboration of the ISU representative and the sports director. Who goes to what chair now is possible in the rule, and then it would be decided amongst the people on site who makes the emergency replacement. Does that clarify your question? Yeah. But for education purposes, Alexandro, we would not just say, okay, you go to the video, you go to the ice, and then you switch. We, that, that's not the intention at this moment. So basically, exactly to your question, this is what it means. It means that the video referee can be named the first assistant, even though he's sitting in the chair of the video referee. So if something happens to the chief, he can step in. He or she can step in. It also means that there was discussion at the Congress this year that uh, maybe we want to explore more than one video referee. Well, with this rule, we would have the opportunity to do that. So also on the same rule, 290, the referee can delegate tasks to other officials in order to assist him or her to carry his or her duties. In the case of real races, the, re the referee may assign other attending official listed on the list of international referee starter and competitor steward to also assist him. Basically, again, this means, for instance, that a referee could for a portion of, of the event for our education purposes, which is what we've been discussing for a long time, maybe for the repechage, maybe for some portion of the Friday, could delegate some of his responsibility to an assistant in order for the assistant to gather the experience of being a referee. That's what it means. It also means that during relay race, you can use extra sets of eyes 
Um, we have a lot of skaters on the ice, sometimes 20 with five relay team. And basically it's a challenge to see, and it's so much action. It's a challenge to really see what's going on there. Um, so you can use, for instance, uh, us extra uh, referee. Most of the time you have your heat box stewards. That is also a referee, so you can use that person. You can use extra official competitor steward or starter just to wave and flag things. And then, of course, the referee makes the decision. Starters. The starters are in control of the starting procedure. The starter assigned to the respective category gives the verbal comment of the starts and announces the decision in English. Both starters have the authority to recall the start. The starters will agree on how to call infringement of the starting rule. Basically, for the past few years, we've been uh, working with starters working as a team. Even though one is assigned to ladies, the other is assigned to men, they're both actually working all the 100% of the start. And we've seen that it reduced significantly the number of false start that sometime we really did not recall. Um, so we've narrowed it down now to almost zero because they work as a team. So that collabor collaboration has been proven to uh, be extremely efficient. And this is something that we now want to keep. And now in the rule book, it basically says that although one is assigned to uh, one gender and the other to the other gender, they're really working as a team of starters. And also, in reality, we have more and more races where um, you have seven, sometimes eight, sometimes even nine starter, um, and basically, uh, uh, not nine starter, nine skater on the line. It becomes a huge challenge for a starter to see all the skaters. Sometimes they're lined up over two lines. Okay. Moving on to a rule about the equipment of the skater. So now we've made it mandatory that the skater have cut resistant glove or mitts. Basically, it's for safety. And for ISU event, Olympic Winter Game, and Youth Olympic Winter Game, those gloves or mitts must be predominantly white. Now, we're not going to inspect which category of white it is. If it's beige, if it's a little dark, not dark, but a little, it's not a perfect white, uh, it's still white. Okay, and predominantly it means that if there's a little bit of black in the, where, the, where the attachment is, it's still predominant. But if, if the inside is white and the outside is black, that's not happening. Okay, so it has to be a shade of white for our event. Of course, not for little kids that are you know, five and six years old. It's not mandatory. The cut proof is though, cut resistant I mean. It's good that the mic is always close to you, Alexandro. <laughs> we should keep it there, I think. And if they don't have it, they don't enter in the ice? They can borrow a pair from someone else. OK. Sorry, just to be clear on that one. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's mandatory for yeah. ISU events, etc. But for other events, like ISU, uh, like uh, Star Class or whatever, yeah. is, the cut proof, is that not mandatory as well? The cut proof is mandatory. So the cut proof is mandatory for? The white is not. So The color is not mandatory. Uh, okay, so okay, cut let proof me go, is. Let... So, for everybody, cut resistant glove or mitts. Okay. Okay, it's just not clear. It looks as though it's cut resistant gloves or mitts for ISU events. No, there's a dot there. Okay. But, uh, okay. There's another sentence that goes before. I just highlighted the change. So just to be clear, it is mandatory for everybody to have cut resistant glove or mitt. The only thing that relates only to our event and Olympic game and youth Olympic game is the color. Is that, does that make it more clear? So, for our needs, for the, our events, we want to be able to see the, the hand better. For our referees to be able to, when they watch video, 
and they're trying to look, was there a hand push or a hand block? This will make it much easier to see the hand. For every other competition, they can have red gloves. As long as it's cut resistant, it's fine. We now have, this was a proposal from Australia, I believe. We now have uh, that for the junior athletes at the World Championship, they can have a world record. for. So there will be junior lady teams over the distance of 3,000 meter and same for men, uh, world record. At the current moment, the only time they can skate the world record will be at the junior world championship. But if eventually we have a World Cup or other ISU official event for junior, then also there they will be able to uh, have world record. The world record at the moment doesn't exist. So the first race, so for those of you who will be at the junior world championship, you will assist to many world record. So that covers the special regulation. We're moving on to the technical rules for short track speed skating. So under the technical rule, we have the new mixed gender relay, which is a 2,000 meter. We also have the possibility to explore, eventually, other distance. It means that we officially have a new relay distance and a new mixed gender relay in our ISU event and also at the Olympic Winter Game. So this is something that uh, we should really be happy and proud of. We have new fixed number of skaters for our main, for our programs. Basically, in red, you see the changes. So we will run 500 meters semi-final with uh, five skaters on the fixed schedule. We will run the 1,000 meter final with five skaters, and we will run the 1,500 meter final with seven skaters. Yes. Thanks. Stuart, Thanks, first. The, this new rule is in the communication 2193, is that correct? So everybody's aware where that can be held? That's yes. where the, the layouts are for the preliminaries and the quarterfinals and... Yeah. Okay. It's, uh, yeah, it's applicable to the World Cup, so yes, it is in that communication okay. of the World Cup. It's also applicable to the championship, not just the okay. World Cups. It's for the okay. whole season. Okay. Bernard? Uh, for 500 meters, what about uh, sharing uh, between f f uh, A and B finals? Sharing, what do you mean? Sh me. Sharing. Uh, do we have then... Uh, uh, a final with four skaters and a B final with six? No, we have an A final with a fixed schedule of four skater and a B final with a fixed schedule of four skater. That doesn't include extra advancement, right? Okay. Finals with an S. So both finals have the same number of skaters predicted. Okay, same with the 1,000 meter. So A final would be with five, B final would be with five. So two semi-finalists are excluded? Perhaps, yes, yes, maybe more. Like for instance, if in the 1,000 meter, you could have advancement to the semi-final and then you don't necessarily keep all of them, right? But the number of fixed skater in the finals applies to A and B finals. And of course, these number may change if we have uh, advancement, okay. So basically, the increased number of fixed skater, uh, fixed starting places for skater, this proposal was directly linked to uh, to another proposal that we will that also is really important that we'll talk about. Why we've put this proposal forward is these number of skaters per race are what we believe are best for a balance between a great show and also the safety of the athletes. So, and this proposal, as I said, is directly linked to the next one about the priority of advancement over qualified by time. In effect, in many races, there will be less skaters than previously because of these rule change. We ended up quite often with eight or nine skaters and we ended up quite often with six skaters in the 500 meter quarterfinal last year and the year before, which is 
a little outside of the ideal number in our opinion. So this is the second part that is directly linked to those new numbers. When we proposed the five and seven extra, if this proposal would not have been accepted, the other one was directly linked to it. We did not want one without the other. So in the case of race winners, second place skaters, and advanced skaters, if it does not fill up to the scheduled number of skaters in the next round, then the fastest third may be added to the next round. Sometimes we don't pick the top two, sometimes we pick just the first, for instance, in World Cups. Then this same principle apply to the next skater uh, in, after the quali direct qualifying position. This one is a big change. It's a new way to qualify skater to the next round. So only skaters in direct qualifying position, this is for the referee, will for sure make it to the next round and for sure are protected. The skaters that are qualified by time, which in our past were also protected when you looked at the replay for an advancement, now we're saying that only the direct qualifying position and I will show it to you later. The skater potentially qualified by time will have to wait and if, to find out if they will or not. Um, that will depend on how many advancements we have. And the reason I just said is because we too, many, too often ended up with too many skaters. In effect, we are adopting a concept that exists in many other sports and it's the concept of the lucky loser. Basically, those, uh, you, you consider those just those in direct qualifying position as the, squader, the, the, the athletes moving on. And sometimes you have a lucky loser that fills up the quota when you need one. It's kind of this concept. So we're saying that the advanced skater are a priority over the buy time. Skaters who were impeded for which another skater receives a penalty, a yellow card or a red card, and at the moment of the infringement, were in one of, the, of those direct qualifying position, will be advanced to the next round. Not optional anymore. So by saying that if a skater or a team in direct qualifying position, and then the referee decides that there was impeding, then it is an automatic advancement, which means that the advancement must be made. For ISU events, Olympic Winter Game and Winter Youth Olympic Game, a final B with one skater or relay team will not be skated, and the qualified skater or team will be assigned the corresponding rank and points. We had uh, sometimes two, sometimes one. It was really complicated for all of you to keep track, even for Hugo, sometimes was like, okay, today is it one, is it two? Um, so it created confusion. So now it's fixed. It's always one, we don't race, two, we do. Clear for everybody. Same way across the board for all our events and same way as also the Olympic game. And it's to make it simpler and less confusing for all of us. Whoops. Okay. This basically refers mostly to um, things that are happening in first round at the bottom of the classification. So uh, it just gives an order how you list or how you rank those skaters at the very bottom of um, a classification. So basically, this is the, the order. So skaters who fail to finish in the first qualifying round will be before the skaters who were not withdrawn but did not start in that respective ranking final, will be above a skater receiving a penalty in the first qualifying round, and then receiving a yellow card in any qualifying round, receiving a red card in any qualifying round, uh, did not start in the first qualifying round. So these people are not ranked, but they're listed as participants at the bottom of the classification in the above order. It will be done in the exact same way in all ISU events. 
that refers to the, the first part of this rule. For ISU event, Olympic Winter Game and Winter Youth Olympic Game final, oh, am I going, I'm going backwards. That's it when you get my age and you have glasses. <laughs> okay, now we're going in the right direction. <laughs> None of you are my age, right? You're much younger. Okay, before the start of any relay race, the name of those competing must be submitted to the competitor steward. In the case of a restart or a rerun of the relay race, a substitution within the team can be made. What does it mean? It means in an instance where there was a, there was a crash, there was a fall, there was maybe an injury, you stop the race, the race is called back, the team can, for whatever reason, either they have an injury, they have a blade broken, they, they, all the teams can make a change. It also means that if something was to happen even before the race, you have a start, or even before the start actually, you have a skater knocking in the competitor, a track steward, get a blade clash, they could make a swap at any time. Okay? They need to be ready for the start, but they can make a, they can make a change within their team. Say your question again. Do the, do the, when you put the original entry in for the relay, you put four names in? When you put your final entry for that race, you would put the four names to the competitor okay. steward? Yeah. If there's a rerun, yeah. you put another entry in if you make a change. Uh, I don't think you would have time to put another entry in, but I think uh, there's two ways we're going to figure out that there's another skater. There would be the comp either the competitor steward see this um, and the referee see this because they will have to get out. Uh, you're going to have to open the door for them so you would know this. Uh, they're not going to put another sheet, but officially with their transponder, we will know exactly who's on the ice. So sure. in the final no, just version... Just to clarify whether they have to put yeah. another entry in or... That's a good question entry. for the competitors too. I don't think they would have time to go put another entry in. Or do you put five, uh, the original you, entry has five names on yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. So you would have the name of the substitute anyway, right? Yeah. Only, only if you have to put five names. If yeah. you only have to put four names. Normally they put five names, always. And then they decide who are the four and they give that announcement. So now you would use that fifth one. You cannot just invent another skater. But the swap is possible, and there won't be time to make that correction. Sometime there won't be time to announce that correction before the race starts, but we would still know who are the skaters on the ice. Uh, the announcer uh, are quite good at figuring out who's on the ice, but yes. This is also new um, and uh, applies mostly for um, seeding in all events, now including the championship. So this is another really big, important change. Basically, for each distance, the current world ranking list will be used as seeding list for the first qualifying round. <laughs> this is not new. Skaters without a world ranking will be placed on the seeding list after the skaters with a world ranking. The best season time over the distance will be used to determine a ranking for the makeup of the first round of each of the related distance. Okay, so now we're, we're making a, a more fair seeding instead of just a random draw for those skaters. The skaters who have not submitted times or whose time have been rejected will be given a ranking by means of a draw conducted by the competitor steward. Point D is really important. For all other qualifying rounds, the current distance classification will be used as seeding list. This is the biggest change. So what it means, it means that in an overall championship, only the distance classification and only the distance world ranking will be used to make the seeding. So it means, in, in practicality, that 
when we used to have the 1500 meter, which is the first distance in a, in a championship, the 1500 meter skater scoring points carried on in their seeding throughout the whole competition. Now, with this new rule, it means that the seeding for the quarterfinal of on day one, the 500 meter, for instance, is not what will have happened right before. It's based on the previous round of the 500 meter. And the same applied to the 1,000 meter. This is a big change. It gives a more fair uh, chance to the skaters who are specialists of the 500 meter and specialists of the 1,000 meter in an overall competition. Is this one clear for everybody? OK. OK. So rule 296, drawing and seating. So this is a big change uh, from before. Basically, first part, no change. For the first distance, the current world ranking list will be used as seeding list for the first qualifying round. Skaters that don't have a world ranking will be placed on a seeding list after the skaters with a world ranking. And the best season time over the distance will be used to determine a ranking for the makeup of the first round of each of the related distance. So instead of doing a drawing with all those skaters that didn't have a world ranking, now we will go by time. And only when we don't have a time, or when that time is rejected, then with those skaters we will do a draw. The most important change is uh, what you see under D. And, for, and it's for all other qualifying round, the current distance classification will be used as a seeding list. This is the biggest change uh, in, this, in this old rule. And basically what it means is, even if it's an overall championship, only the distance classification will be used, uh, as, uh, and the world ranking distance at the beginning will be used to make the seeding. And so it means that the skaters winning point in the first distance will no longer carry over for their seeding of the quarterfinal, for instance, of the 500 meter, right after the 1500 meter on the Saturday program. And it's not carrying over for the seeding of the quarterfinal uh, distance of the 1000 meter. So only their result in the 500 meter is what is being used for the seeding of the next round, and same thing for the 1000 meter. So we are no longer protecting the winners of the first distance to give them a little bit of an ad advantage over the other distance. So the specialists of the 500 meter have a chance to have their proper seeding to move on. The specialists of the 1000 meter have a chance to have their proper seeding to move on. All this is still under a cumulative overall championship, but it's the same basic seeding principle for all the distance. So we believe it's more fair for the specialist of all distance to have equal access to this overall title. And then under 297, individual racing rule, any skater or relay team who is bound to be lap, either for the first time or other time, must move to the outside and may not interfere with the skaters and relay teams overtaking them. Violation with interference will result in a yellow card or a red card. We all agree that red cards are quite, we don't issue them uh, on very often. But it's not just a penalty, this kind of infringement. Uh, now we're saying it's an automatic yellow card if it has, of course, a consequence on the race. If it doesn't have a consequence at all, uh, if it doesn't impede at all with the race, then it's nothing. So we believe why, why we came up with this rule. We really believe that this type of unsportsmanship should never happen. And unfortunately, we've seen it growing over the past few, few seasons. It is to the detriment of the sport, and it's unfair for the athletes to see their result changed by someone being a lap behind. Off track, we just made a small change to the texting of, of this rule. We're just saying skating with one or both skates on the left side of the curve marked by the track marking blocks. Um, basically, again, it refers to if you're falling and you're sliding on, on your leg, um, on your side, inside the block, it is an off track in effect. You have been inside the block, but it is not an off, an off track that should result in a penalty.
So we believe that this type of infringement that should be called, uh, that should result with a penalty, should apply to the skaters that are going inside when making a pass or when skating. It should not apply to skater falling and, and it should not apply to skater sliding inside or skater trying to, for safety reason, trying to not, and we went into example uh, with video with the referee, it should not apply to skaters who are really just trying to avoid a serious injury to someone else. And by, I, and by trying to avoid a serious inju injury, I don't mean going inside because you made a bad pass and you don't want to crash everybody. That is still an off track that would result in a penalty. Relay racing rule. A skater from a team can only come on the track to make an exchange. Skaters entering before an exchange and skaters exiting after an exchange are also subjected to the applicable racing rule. It, mean that unless, it means that unless you were clearly coming in the track to make an exchange, if you are on the track and you are impeding a team, you may get a penalty. It also means that even if you came to make an exchange, if you're really impeding the race, you were not successful, well, successful or not in making your exchange, you're still subject to maybe receiving a penalty. The non-racing members of each team must stay out of the path of the racing skaters and in an area that is clearly inside the curve, marked by track marking blocks and a virtual line between the last block and the first block of the curve. Only to make an exchange, a skater must leave this area, and the line between the last and first block may be marked by blocks. Uh, maybe it's not, that's the wrong word here. They made by little dots, right? At this moment, we haven't start with the little dots yet, uh, but eventually that's a possibility to explore. Hugo already sees a challenge with sharing the ice with figure skating at the Olympics. I don't, it's going to be a battle to try to put dots in the ice, uh, but we shall see. <laughs> so what it means is extra team members should stay in the middle where they are completely out of the action until they prepare again to accelerate to get a relay. We've seen more and more of those infringements, and it's a challenge for the referee to see all of that happening. It does, um, it does really have an effect on races on many occasions, and more and more we've become able to spot those, to look for those, and to be able to give the proper uh, outcome for the race. Exchanges are to be made without interference to other teams. During exchange, changing the lane is not allowed, and exchanges are to be made straightforward, directly in front of the skater who is pushing, and the skates have to be kept out of blocking. So this means a, a lot of different possibility. Basically what it means is during the exchanges, the skaters have to make all effort to not push, block, knock other people down. Uh, and when we're saying straightforward, we mean the direction of the first block, right? So everybody's shooting to go ahead towards that first block and that corner. So push sideways, are not acceptable. Splitting when you're pushing for the relay is not acceptable. Coming in to block another team completely off your other skater is not acceptable. Just cleaner exchange and, and, and try to avoid all those crashes and falls that are happening at the moment on too many occasions with our relay. That one will be a challenge for the referee to, to you know, it's already a challenge. <laughs> It will still be a challenge, but we're at least in the rule book are defining a little bit more what's allowed and what is not allowed. So again, it means that the pushes to the left uh, to block are no longer acceptable. Interference inside the track with skaters coming in to take an exchange may also be considered an infringement. Okay, that, that was on the other slide. So what it means is you also need to get out of the way of the skaters coming in to get that relay. You always in a race have four skaters skating in the race and every time before an exchange you, you have most of the time four, but sometimes teams are exchanging in a different way. So you have four other skaters coming in to get that relay no other skaters should be in that lineup if they're not going to get a relay. 
that, that refers to things that are happening on the inside. So we believe that this type of infringement are kind of killing our races because quite often it leads to falls and falls with multiple teams. And it's to give more power to the referee to administer the race. And we also believe that it's just not proper sportsmanship and it goes against our rule of the race has to be won on its merit. Sanctions for infringement of the racing rule of the ISU Code of Ethics. I did not hear, in, uh, the TC here in this presentation did not list the whole, the whole paragraph, if you look in the book, has been redrafted. So most of it is basically just different order uh, to make it more clear, but it didn't change anything on the rule. Uh, but this one has, this one is new. So any skater for whom the race has been stopped to preserve the skater's well-being will not be allowed to take part in the restart unless the skater was unable to continue due to reasons beyond this control. This does not apply to the starting procedure and the results of skaters excluded for this reason from a restart will show no finish. This also applies to relay This part is not really different. The next one is, if a skater is injured resulting from an action by another skater for which a penalty is given, the referee may advance the injured skater or let the skater participate in the restart or the rerun. Get the mic. <laughs> okay. So we have a relay race. Yeah. Um, it is stopped because a, a skater has fell over. Yeah. And he's in a dangerous position. We would say that that skater does not restart because of his well-being. Uh, we also have a, a relay rule that says on a restart, you can substitute a skater. So how do we stop that from happening? So the skater fell on his own? Yeah. You don't restart, they're out of the restart. Yeah, and uh, I'm just saying that yeah. a coach will say, okay, you, this skater can't skate because of his well-being, but we're going to substitute him who, with a healthy skater. Yeah. This applies to the first part of the rule, right? Yeah. You will, it always, it's always the case. The skater is not re-skating unless there's a clear penalty, which is the second part of the rule. Same applies to the relay. So if team fall, two, two scenario, a relay team falls on its own, they have an injured skater, you stop the race because of that team and the injured skater, you restart the race without the team, even though they have a substitute waiting. Second scenario, there's a collision, one of many that we, current, we have in a relay. You have a collision, you have a team that falls, you, have, you, you, have, you, restart the, you stop the race. While you have stopped the race and the injured skater, you go to watch the video, clearly you see that there's a penalty. You restart the race without the team with the penalty, but with the team with the injured skater, without the injured skater that is being substituted by is a teammate. I'm very clear on that. Yeah. Um, but as a referee, I am going to get a coach that comes to me, shows me the rule book, and says, this skater can't skate because, we skate, because it says well-being. I'm but not clear on what's not clear on this. Well, I just think... Um, in a relay, the, the, you're going to have a restart. Yeah. The reason we're saying that that skater cannot restart, or that team, is because of the skater's well-being. It's, it's in that rule. The, the first part hasn't really changed. We're no. just giving the second part, a second option, that instead of having just two teams or two skaters out of restarting, if there was a penalty, we're saying basically they got injured because of someone else, yeah. Then they can restart. What, what do I say to the coach that says, why can't this skater, why can't this team restart? Because we stopped the race because of that skater. But when there's an impeding, we stopped the race because of the other skater who made that skater fall. I know, it's just that the, <laughs> the, the way the rule is worded, it says the reason we can't let them start is because of their well-being. No, you stopped the race before their well-being. That's not the reason why they can't restart. It says to preserve their well-being. Oh, okay. Okay, let me go at it again because maybe you're not the only one who misunderstood. We're stopping a race because there's an injured skater that can't stand up. 
That's, that's the scenario here. He, fell on, he or she fell on his own. Cannot restart. We stopped the race because there's a skater stuck in a mat with the blade inside of the mat. They can restart. We stopped the race because there's an injured skater that can't stand up, and that skater is injured because of a impeding, because something happened for whatever reason. There is a penalty that you give right away. So you're putting a skater or a team out. That skater, if, if he's OK to restart, he can restart. Still not clear? Alexandra? Uh, how about the shared responsibility? So if we have two relay teams falling, they are both responsible for a fall. So by this rule for a shared responsibility, we decide not to give a penalty, but we stop the race because of the skater's well-being. What do we do after? Because by this rule, we should give a penalty. But if we don't want to give a penalty because they were both responsible for the fall, what do we do? If you don't give a penalty, you don't have the, skate, the team restart. If you do give a penalty, that injured team can do the swap of the athlete if he's still injured and then can restart. So we can actually lose two teams if there is a shared responsibility between two relays. If, okay. <laughs> now you're confusing me. You're not giving a penalty. I'm not giving a penalty, but yeah. for example, third and fourth position of the relay, they are falling together. Yeah. Bo yes. They are both, both are responsible injured. for the fall. They yeah. are both injured, lay down, not able to get up. But by this rule, we should actually give a penalty, but they are both responsible. So we don't want to penalize both relays. So do we allow a restart if they have a skaters no. or not? No. So then we lose two teams, actually. Yes. OK. Brett, you need to come to the mic, please. So I'm going to be first of him. Then you said that if you stop a race because a skater is stuck under the mat, he's too pressure, he can? If it's because of our equipment. If, if our he's falling by himself. But that, that's not new, actually. No, yeah. I stopped the race because of him. You stop the race because our equipment prevents him from being able to skate. Okay. Then he can restart. Okay. Yeah. And it's not just for his safety, it's for the safety of everybody else in that case. Yeah. Brett? If in the case there's a penalty in a fall, is the, and the penalty is between third and fourth skater, previously we've been told a penalty, an advancement can only be given in first and second direct qualifying positions. Mm. In this race, we have a penalty resulting in a fall between the third and fourth skater. Can we still give an advancement? Yes. The, the short answer is yes, yes, because you stop the race. We're still thinking, we're still talking, you stop the race, right? The next if you did not stop the race, no. But you stop the race for safety, for what? Uh, yeah, yes, you have a penalty, even if they were not at that moment in direct qualifying position. For instance, you could stop the race with 44 laps to go in a 5,000 meter. Yes. So the next question from a competitor steward. A skater is advanced, but they don't finish the race. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And it would be a finish no time, right? Uh, declare finished, I think. Finish. Yeah. Declared finished, but they wouldn't start the race. On the restart, uh, on the they would not do the restart. They can still be advanced. Yeah. Yeah. So it'd be, they wouldn't start on the race, on the restart. But right. They would be advanced. I think that's a good question, actually. I I think they would be uh, finished no time, or I don't. I'm not sure how we would put that down, but definitely they can be advanced. I think this is a good note to, to mark. Um, and we'll come up with, uh, with how we list them on the next uh, race or on the finish of this race. Is that clear for everybody what Brett had just asked? OK. So you rerun the race, and you had an injured skater. 
that still, as the, there was a penalty, he still can be advanced to the next round. How we will write how he's finished not racing, the, the, I'm not sure at this moment, but the intention is that that skater can move on. Okay. <coughs> Okay. <laughs> so why we are doing that is because we just believe that's what's the most fair for skaters and team. And also, to your point, Alexandra, we don't want to end up restarting races with two skaters less, as much as possible. But in your particular example, we would have no choice. Under the same redrafting, there's this one also that is different, is the announcer must inform the spectators immediately of the decision that has been taken. With approval of the technical committee, the referee may also announce the decision over the public address system. This is the old, um, um, you know, we have discussion with the referee uh, about the, the language to describe a little bit more our uh, penalties, our infringement. Uh, and basically, this opens the door to uh, test with a microphone starting to use that language that we've started to develop. Will we use it this year? How we will use it? How this will develop? Will it be the house announcer? Will it be sometime the referee? We'll definitely gonna practice a few things and don't rest assured that we will not throw you out there in the lion cage before you're ready. So it means that the referee may eventually have that headset and announce the penalties and advancement and describe with the language that we're putting together what just happened in the race. Starting procedure. If a skater is interfered with and fall before the last block of the first curve after the start line, then the skater shall, and then the race Ah, oh, sorry, there's a line that disappeared. The race should be called back and start again. The decision whether the interference is an offense according to the racing rule is a decision of the referee. So basically, what it means is that before we were talking about the apex, did the actions happen before, did it happen after, there was sometime cases where it started before, the skater fell after, it was really complicated and not fair. So now we're saying the whole corner is part of the starting um, procedure. So if things happen before the end of the curve, then the starter can recall the race with the same condition as before, but just extending the zone to the whole first corner. It's more fair for the skater. Quite often the falls started before the apex and finished were concluded after. Um, we will be much more consistent, we believe, with this, and we will have a better show. Before start, the equipment of a skater may be fixed. We changed that, it, you, I don't remember exactly the wording before, I think it was staying on the ice, you had to touch the ice somehow, but our padding structure are so thick that it becomes really complicated to actually do anything. So now we've changed it to without going beyond the padding. Um, and they have to be ready to come back when the race is ready to go. So basically, what it means is all the arrows that you see there, everything you see on this picture is all accepted. It is okay that this, they're not, no longer touching the ice, they are on the, on the padding structure. It is okay if they put their feet on the other side, they don't need to keep one on the ice side. Everything that they're, they're staying in that zone, everything that they can do to make this transition, this fixing quicker is okay. Does that make sense to all of you? So you don't need to monitor exactly, are they still on the ice? Are they still touching the ice? Are they still on the side of the ice? Especially if you go to extreme padding system that we have sometime like in China and Shanghai where the padding is double, they need to be able to access their technician. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. How many time do you give to change blades? Okay, this is not a fixed time because it will depend on what happened. There are situations where clearly there's pieces of blade missing, sometimes even more than one piece. 
So you know that in those in instances, they need to change the blades, right? We've also seen this year extension, big extension of this time with skaters that were not even involved with the click of the blade. So um, it is not a fixed time. It really depends on the situation. We will tell the coaches and team leader at the beginning of the season uh, that uh, they, they were pushing the limits just for recovery in some instance, that we will be a little bit more because we know they can do, do this very quickly. We've seen it quite often. Um, so we will try to, to have them speed up their process a little bit. But still, it's a judgment call that you decide. Um, and, uh, and also, I think you, you need to start paying attention who's actually still sitting on the mats fixing their blade. Um, if they were the direct skaters involved in the blade broken, then you can be a little bit more generous. But if they, ha if they had nothing to do with it, then you can blow the whistle. And then they have 10 seconds to come to the line. Thank you. Alexandro. Do they have a, a fixed area in which they have to do this? in the coach's box, coach's or box. they can even do, for example, if the technician is uh, on the other side of the... Coach's box. Only there. Period. Okay. And the technician is allowed to enter the yeah, coach's yes, box. Yes, I, I saw the rule, but... Coach's box. They cannot start going all over the place. You lost track of them. No, coach's box. That was the last one. Olympic Games? Nothing new? Yes, question. Just a different uh, question that's not on the rule changes. We noticed the starters were asking us that there's no t countdown clock this year. Is that correct? That there's no 40 seconds to get to the front or 10 seconds? There's so that no. Was one. So there's nothing. Hey, this year for that, is that correct? You can give the, 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 the mic to Hugo, to, Hugo to answer okay. that question. Because a 10 second again, you brought that up, so I want to make sure we understand. Uh, well, yes, this is correct. Uh, since I'm conducting the flow of the event, uh, the ICU events, ICU World Cups and, uh, and championships, I'm anyhow giving the signal to the starters when to start with the next round. So we make, always make sure that everything is in good order, the referee is ready, so I will always have an eye contact with the chief referee. Uh, when I see that everything is okay, then I give again the sign to the starters that they can, give the, can blow the whistle. So I will be conducting the event and will take uh, care about the flow um, of the competition. So that's the, the reason why there's no need to have any, any more than 45 seconds uh, countdown clock. Because I'm anyhow in contact with the TV director and uh, have a minute-by-minute minute schedule in order to uh, go with the right flow based on the program. Is that also during the qualification uh, program, uh, Hugo? Uh, during the qualification program, usually we don't have uh, live TV. So basically, we can a little bit be more flexible. Uh, we don't have uh, clear restraints on timing, but I will try to make uh, the same procedure also during the Friday sessions. Maybe it can be a little bit more flexible um, during repechage and drinking races, but I will try to do the same procedure also during the Friday qualifying, qualifying sessions. There was another question in front, first row. Exactly the same. So I hope that answered the 45 second down, countdown clock. It's about the starting <coughs> procedure. So now a uh, referee only calls if uh, there is a fall in first uh, corner? No, the starter can call too. Absolutely. Okay. So this is the first uh, part. The two starter can call, the both two. of them. Yeah. Whether oh. they were the one shooting yeah. the gun or the other one. Okay, that's clear. Uh, but now, in case of second for start, mm -hmm. the starter decides, but the referee gives the penalty, no? 
well, no, it, in effect, it's the starter who yeah. issues the penalty, saying to the skater, you have a false okay. start. Um, at the end of the race, though, f this is why we have in the code, normally we give the announcement yeah. of a penalty, and then maybe the, the referee would say, in this race, there was a penalty okay, for a so second false start. That same, but that it, nothing has changed. Okay. It's still the starters. Thank you. Yeah. Any other question on any of the main, uh, main rule change? I guess I was clear. <laughs> okay. Well, I thank you for your uh, patience. And uh, if you have questions or if you want to communicate, if you're watching from home and, and you do have questions now or later when, uh, when you review this, you can email us at dvcommission at isu.ch. And if you really want, this was the vast majority of the rules, but not 100% of them were in that presentation. So if you want the complete document, com documentation on the rule change, uh, you can go on the ISU website at isu.org, and you can download the complete uh, uh, special regulation and technical rule. I thank you for joining us from uh, all over the world. I thank you in the room for, uh, for uh, your attention lunch break now, and uh, we will come back uh, in a few minutes. Thank you.